Good morning. Today is Thursday, January 6th. It's 9.02 a.m. and this is a meeting of Senate Natural Resources and Energy. Um, and we're continuing our week one uh, work to bring us up to speed on things that have happened since we adjourned last, uh, last spring. Um, uh, just a couple housekeeping notes. So uh, we don't uh, stream our meeting with captions turned on because uh, the fully automated instantaneous live captioning is has so many inaccuracies that it is uh, been judged problematic. However, there's a far more accurate captioning and transcript available once uh, approximately 24 hours has gone by automatically added by YouTube. So for the time being, we're not streaming caption as we work, but if anybody watching the uh, proceedings uh, needs uh, to have a real-time captioning, please let uh, our committee assistant, Judith Newman, or me know, and we will turn that on for the uh, meetings in which you're planning to attend. Uh, but otherwise, everyone should know that YouTube has a uh, much more accurate captioning. It's just that it follows 24 hours after the meeting. And there's also a written transcript available. Uh, secondly, we uh, have an open door policy for uh, having people who are not necessarily uh, testifying on a bill but wish to, quote unquote, be in the room. Um, and so, for instance, Today, uh, Commissioner Walk is sort of visiting with us. He's not a formal witness. Um, if anyone wants to uh, uh, participate in a committee heating, a meeting, either the sort of in the room status or to be an actual witness delivering testimony, as usual, please let, uh, again, Jude or me know, and uh, we will do our best to add you to the uh, agenda. Um, with that, I think um, that's it for housekeeping for the moment. Um, gonna, one of the things that we talked about very briefly last spring, and then we adjourned, and there's been a lot of development uh, in the interim, is that there's a proceeding across the street at the Public Utility Commission related to a, uh, an application on the part of Global Foundries um, and a complimentary one from Green Mountain Power. Uh, in order for uh, Global Foundries to become a uh, utility regulated with uh, certain de minimis provisions. So it's, we don't have as a committee uh, an active role to play in terms of uh, that application, it being administratively complete, I think last March. Um, however, it's of interest to us because there's an impact uh, on uh, all ratepayers actually, when uh, a customer of Global Foundry size leaves the uh, the territory of GMP, uh, so we just want to be aware. The other thing is, for the sake of transparency, I want to note that um, as an individual senator, I wrote to the PUC. Um, I think it was around uh, the the very beginning of December, something like that, and. I distributed a copy to members of the committee. So you'll know what my own take is. But again, today is not about arguing for or against that application. It's just to come up to speed on how things have happened, you know, what has unfolded and what the current timeline is. Um, I think later on as a policy discussion, we might uh, get involved in, um, questions about what if a similar application were to come forward and how would, do we wanna consider the potential for others to make similar applications? So with that, a lead in, I'd like to turn to our counsel, Ms. Tchaikovsky, who has been um, helping us all by following the proceeding and it's gonna give us a, bring us up to date on where we are with what's happened since last May, basically. Maybe you should even start with the application in the spring. Sure. Uh, good morning, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, please let me know if at, at any point you can't hear me. I'm having some issues this morning. 
Um, but yes, so Global Foundries has uh, filed a petition with the Public Utility Commission. It's petition 21-1107 PET. It is a petition for a certificate of public good under 30 VSA section 231. The, the words in this conversation are very particular. Um, I do wanna correct the chair slightly and say, the application is not specifically to become a utility. However, Global Foundries is seeking to be regulated by the Public Utility Commission and what they're calling this entity is a self-managed utility, which will in a lot of ways look different than a regular utility, but I don't wanna to get too in the weeds about the differences specifically. Section 231 uh, regulates companies within the PUC's jurisdiction. So Global Foundries has applied to be a, operate as a company within the PUC's jurisdiction. This petition was filed on uh, March 17th, there was a, a um, related petition filed by Global, uh, Green Mountain Power to amend their service territory to exclude Global Foundries from their service, tori service territory so that they would no longer be a customer of Green Mountain Power. I spoke to your committee on this issue on April 27th, so I did. you did hear on that day also from Global Foundries, as well as the Public Service Department. Uh, Senate Finance has al also held um, a couple of hearings around that time also. Uh, since the legislature broke for the session, uh, a few things have happened, uh, but I'll take a step back. So Global Foundries has filed a petition at the Public Utility Commission. Green Mountain Power is also a party in this proceeding as their petition is directly related to Global Foundries. There are also a number of parties by right under the statute, but also intervening parties that have joined the proceeding before the Public Utility Commission. Uh, currently, the parties are Global Foundries and Green Mountain Power, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, Conservation Law Foundation, Renewable Energy Vermont, All Earth Renewables Inc., Stowe Electric Department, Velco, uh, VT Transco, Burlington Electric Department, VIPSA, uh, the Department of Public Service, of course, and ANR joined as a party over the summer, and I'll mention that briefly. Um, so when we last spoke, uh, a number of the parties had already joined uh, and had started to file some pre-file testimony. Um, but in June, the Department of Public Service uh, filed their initial filings. They filed pre-filed testimony from Ed McNamara, uh, stating that the department would support Global Foundry's concept conceptualization of a self-managed utility subject to de minimis regulation provided that the PUC impose a condition that requires Global Foundries to develop a satisfactory greenhouse gas mitigation proposal with meaningful and enforceable obligations. So DPS provided that they would support this moving forward, but only if the PUC would provide, would require a condition on the CPG with meaningful uh, greenhouse gas mitigation. Uh, Global Foundries responded in, in its rebuttal testimony that it would agree to a condition setting a commitment to greenhouse gas emission reduction, uh, provided that the goals and mechanisms specified were uh, practicable. So in September, uh, the Department of Public Service submitted a letter of intent that was signed by Global Foundries, the department, and ANR. Uh, regarding their intent to enter into a memorandum of understanding, establishing a greenhouse gas emissions reduction plan. Uh, as it uh, was interpreted, the parties planned to negotiate greenhouse gas reductions um, and were planning to submit the plan to the PUC as a proposed condition of the, the certificate of public good. It was at this point that um, ANR joined 
this proceeding as a party. So, uh, and part of that reason was A&R is the agency within the state whose job it is, is to uh, protect the interests of the state, particularly in regard to um, air pollution and uh, greenhouse gas reduction and climate change. So that was September 23rd. The parties were looking to have a finalized greenhouse gas reduction, reduction proposal uh, by November 15th. In the interim, there were a lot of other issues that the other parties were briefing and discussing as part of the case. So during the summer and fall, there were no hearings on this case. There were just um, a lot of motions filed as well as briefs on the legal issues, as well as requests from information from the various parties. So a form of discovery was taking place. They were seeking information and um, information was going back and forth between all of the parties. All this information is available on the PUC's website, EPUC. But so, so a number of other legal issues came up during the summer that the PUC and the other parties were interested in. So on uh, September 30th, the PUC issued two orders. Uh, one asking Global Foundries for additional information. Um, and then the other asked all of the parties to brief on two specific legal questions. First, they asked uh, whether the PUC had jurisdiction to grant Global Foundries request to operate as a self-managed utility under de minimis regulation. I think this is the question that a lot of, um, that came up a few times during the hearings before the legislature last year, um, whether or not this is a issue that the PUC has jurisdiction over. So the PUC has asked the parties to brief this issue and provide legal arguments on whether or not the PUC has jurisdiction. They also asked <clears throat> whether um, all the parties to provide legal arguments on whether Global Foundry's tenants are customers such that the operations, if continued, would uh, if continued to provide power to those tenants, would constitute public a public service business. So this is another um, sort of complicated aspect of this proposal. Global Foundries has a very large campus. Um, on that campus, not only is their facility, but also a number of smaller tenants, uh, other businesses who are currently their tenants. Global Foundries is their landlord. So uh, <clears throat> a few of the parties raised whether or not uh, these are, by providing power to these tenants, are they in fact acting as a utility if they were providing power to these um, entities? So the parties were asked to brief those issues and they did. So the, the legal briefs on those issues were due on November 8th. <clears throat> Global Foundries and Green Mountain Power filed briefs addressing those issues. In addition, all Earth Renewables uh, filed, a, a, filed briefs, but also filed a motion to dismiss the case. And the Conservation Law Foundation filed a motion for summary judgment, which would also effectively end the proceeding. Uh, a few days later, <clears throat> on November 12th, uh, Global Foundries filed a letter with the PUC stating that they had not reached an agreement with the Department of Public Service and ANR regarding the, the greenhouse gas reduction plan. So there isn't um, currently an MOU or greenhouse gas reduction plan before that has been submitted to the PUC. Uh, and the, the <clears throat> there were further reply briefs follow, uh, that followed that. Um, so at the moment, uh, there hasn't been any movement on the case in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, the parties filed their, their final sort of legal arguments um, in the middle of uh, December on these legal questions. Uh, the PUC has made the rest of the proceeding schedule to be determined. So they canceled the initial hearing on the, on the case and made it to be determined based and, and that will largely be based, I think, on their 
evaluation of the, the legal briefs on the question of jurisdiction, but also they are regard, they are reviewing the motion to dismiss and the motion for summary judgment, which would effectively end the cases if they the case if they approved either uh, agreed with either of those motions. So the rest of the schedule is to be to be determined. Um, so they're sort of in limbo at the moment. The PUC has not weighed in on any of the motions that have been filed uh, recently. So uh, the parties are currently waiting to, I think, to see what the PUC is going to do in response to the legal arguments that have been made and the motions. So that's where the case is right now. It's a little, it's sort of on pause waiting for the PUC's response. Uh, any questions for council? Thank you for that very helpful summary of just the different pieces that are moving along. When I first heard about um, the request for more filings from parties on the questions, et cetera, there was, I don't know if it was officially stated or it was just people guesstimating, but that in the second half of January, they they might um, be, uh, I, I'm not sure what they would be doing. They'd be setting the rest of the schedule, I guess that's what, or, or coming back with a judgment on some of those questions you laid out. So, but what I had heard was the second half of January, we might hear from the PUC. Um, I don't know if you've heard anything more. Sounds like nothing official has come out. I have I haven't heard anything. Okay. There's nothing recent on the EPUC. Okay. And I'm not a party to the case. I'm not in contact with anyone, so I don't know what's going on. Okay. Um, Senator Campion. Thanks, Senator Bright. <clears throat> I missed this part, I think. So our role in this right now, are we sort of observers? Are, is, what, what's the legislative possible um, role in all of this? If any. <laughs> Other than chopped liver? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just trying to, uh, is this um, something that we observe <clears throat> and we watch happen, uh, happening in live time, or is is there a role for the legislature in all this? Um, well, I'll, I'll give a partial answer and I'll look for counsel to keep me on tr track here. From from my understanding, you know, like this, there was an administratively complete application last March. Right. Therefore, um, you know, the statutes of that moment apply to the case and. Um, not that those statutes can't be amended in the future, but um, as they apply to, to everyone in a class, not just a particular category. Um, at any rate, other people, uh, you know, one of the other things we might consider is if this were to move forward, um, how many other uh, entities in the state of Vermont might judge themselves to be in a better position by doing something similar. So I've heard a variety of things. For instance, the UVM uh, campus and health center of Vermont, large customer in BED territory, might they say, we want in essence out, we're gonna go shopping for our own power. Or could you have a virtual consortium, all the ski areas that use a lot of electricity say, we're gonna be a virtual utility and we wanna buy our power in bulk. Um, other large industrial users. So there's a question about what happens to things like our, our, our energy system in the state of Vermont, if we start to have large consumers step out of traditional regulation. Um, and one of the key elements of the global foundries provisions is when they're asking to be subject to de minimis regulation, they, for instance, don't want to be bound by the um, obligation to participate in our renewable energy standard. So that would be 8% of the state's load, leaving one of our major energy 
programs at a time when we're confronting climate change and trying to manage greenhouse gas emissions. Now, there's more one than one way to do it. I'm not saying the RES is the only answer, but um, if this were to become a trend, then I think that that's where I really see um, uh, us looking forward is where I feel like this is this is this is nudging us to look forward at how this might roll out. Sarah McCormick. Thanks. Uh, the way I, I taught this question of just what is the role of the legislature relative to the administration and vice versa. We write the law, but then we hand it off to the administration to administer it. And we are, it's not our role to play administrator. It's not our role to, to decide what the outcome of an administrative procedure ought to be. But it is our role to reconsider the laws that we've written. And the question is, if, if we don't like this happening, then the question is, uh, okay, we don't like it, but is it legal? And if it's not legal, there are, if somehow people are misinterpreting or misusing the law, that will come out administratively or judicially, perhaps. It may be that we don't like it, but it is legal. It may be that it's consistent with the law the legislature has created, in which case we then have to consider, should we rewrite the law? And that's my understanding of what we're doing now, is looking at the situation and say the question, do we like it? If we like it, fine. If we hate it, is it legal? And if the thing we hate is legal, do we need to rewrite the law? And now I can be corrected <laughs> where I screwed up. No, I think, if you don't mind, I think that was a, a really good explanation. And I don't want to, I don't want to go too deep into this, but a lot of people have raised um, the fact that the, the phrase self-managed utility is not in statute. And that's true. Um, and this does appear to be a novel petition before the PUC. There hasn't been anything identical to this before. However, they are making a legal argument that under the current structure, they could do this. And the PUC is currently deciding whether or not they are correct. And so, you know, that's what lawyers do a lot of time is, is try to parse the words and see if what they're trying to do fits under it. And Title 30 is a confusing chapter of law, uh, title of law to read. Um, it is a little bit complicated. And so potentially if, there are there are ways that you could clarify if you would be interested in clarifying for the future. Okay. Um, well, great. Um, so obviously, it's we're just touching base, but I wanted, you know, I think there's potentially some really important ramifications of this docket. And I just wanted to make sure we all stayed apprised of how things had unfolded in between. Um, it's not that we're at the moment deep getting into the record and arguing one interpretation over another, just that we know that where we are in the proceeding. Um, I think we may well come back to this and get into um, more details, but it's also I think we're trying to be sensitive to the fact that we're, there's a question being adjudicated across the street. And um, I think we want to stay in our lane, uh, but uh, not uh, hobble ourselves entirely from thinking about the question. So we'll try to be diplomatic and keep on, keep on working. Um, any other questions for council about where we are? Currently, just sort of facts of the case. Um, all right. Well, th thank you very much for coming in, bring us back up to speed. Um, thanks for um, following it. I, you know, I get because I signed on to the EPUC. Well, I, probably everyone knows this, but um, this will be good to share with the committee and anyone watching remotely. For any particular case or docket that you're interested in, you can go on to the um, Public Utility Commission's website and go to the EPUC um, part of it and sign up to be 
automatically emailed a notification of any filings related to any particular docket that you're interested in following. I know that because I signed up for this docket last spring, um, I haven't done this uh, search by docket member on my email, but the last time I did that in November, I had 238 emails notifying me of things happening. I think it was at the, the PUC. So it's a really voluminous, to me, it seems like a voluminous docket. And um, I wanna thank Ms. Schakowsky for keeping up with it because it's, a, it's been a lot of back and forth, a lot of parties, a lot of interesting questions, a lot of arguments. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm sure we'll be coming back to this in some form or another. Um, so Ms. Tchaikovsky, if you um, hear anything more about schedule across the street, um, if you can help the committees um, keep us informed, that would be very, uh, we'd appreciate that. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, with that, uh, I'm looking around the room and Joyce Manchester's already here. So um, as we've talked about a little before, we have more money flowing through this committee uh, each year, um, which is good news, um, but it's made it more challenging for us to keep up to speed. I mean, the first large tranche of money we saw were commitments around clean water. And now with ARPA money and work on climate change and infrastructure, um, there's literally hundreds of millions of dollars. And um, it's been my sense that the committee has been in a somewhat passive position, you know, where we receive budgets from ANR, for instance, but we haven't had um, regular, we, we have partnered, uh, so, somewhat infrequently with JFO to help us um, follow and actively participate in looking at the money. So this year, we, I talked to Catherine Benham, uh, in the, actually starting in the summer, fall, and about trying to make sure that we uh, work more closely and collaborate with JFO uh, throughout the session so that before we're under a lot of pressure and budgets are closing, et cetera, et cetera, that we've, we're up to, we're well informed on the dollars. We're in a better place to make recommendations other than uh, the administration's, uh, sort of following the administration's proposal when we think that's merited. So um, uh, with that, I'd like to um, welcome Ms. Manchester to the committee and, um, and also, um, one more time, make a public service announcement for the committee and to anyone watching that the that um, Joyce uh, and was a, it was Brianna back then Parker um, put out a, a, a issue brief on climate change, and that was back on November thirtieth, and it's a great summary docket. Uh, sorry, summary document. So. With that, um, I'd like to turn it over and ask you to reintroduce yourself to the committee and um, and then you, if you could talk just a little too as you get started about um, how we can uh, work more closely with you. In essence, I sort of see it as being better clients and uh, of uh, you and the Joint Fiscal Office. So, Ms. Manchester. Thank you very much, Senator Bray. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joyce Manchester from the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, by way of introduction, I've been with the Joint Fiscal Office since 2014. Previously, I spent most of my career in Washington, DC, working for the Congressional Budget Office and also for the Social Security Administration. So I am trained in macroeconomics and public finance. I have a PhD. I've been doing a lot of research throughout my life um, as an economist, but since coming to JFO, I've, I've turned into more of a, a public service economist working for the legislature. So the job of JFO in terms of climate change has been spelled out in the Global Warming Solutions Act, which you all passed back in 2020. And uh, JFO is on the hook to produce a report that looks at the economic, 
budgetary and fiscal impacts of the Climate Action Plan. Yesterday, Secretary Moore did a very nice job presenting the Climate Action Plan to your committee. Um, I wish I could tell you that uh, the Climate Action Plan contains the information we need to do our report. Unfortunately, it does not. It does not provide enough specifics about the cost of the various proposals that are introduced. So we are waiting for that pathways report that Secretary Moore mentioned that will be coming January 20th, that will have more of the quantitative information that we will need in order to look at the economic budgetary fiscal impacts for the state of Vermont. So at this point, we're, we're sort of in a holding pattern. Uh, we're thinking hard about how to approach the subject and, and what the essential elements will be for our report. Um, today, I'm going to provide some background information about climate change in Vermont and the public policy solutions that might be out there. Um, this will include a, a nice review of the spending that has been done by the state of Vermont over the past five years in various programs. Um, I also wanna say that Brianna Parker was an analyst at JFO. She left JFO to move to Colorado back in October. She did a lot of work on this issue brief and we're very grateful to her for all of her good inputs. Um, in November, we hired a, a new economist. Her name is Julia Richter. She's right now in, in the Ways and Means Committee so she couldn't be with us this morning, but I hope soon you'll be able to meet her. Um, she'll be doing a, a good amount of work on the climate change issue as well. Mr. Chair? Yes, Senator McDonald. What's the name of the committee that reported to us yesterday? Uh, you mean, so the Vermont Climate Council wrote a climate action plan and- Okay, my apologies, I thought we were getting mixed up with the Global Warming Solutions Act versus the departments, and I, it's my error. Thank you. Well, the Global yeah, global Warming Solutions Act called for the creation of the Vermont Climate Council that wrote the Climate Action Plan. <laughs> this is like the goose that laid the golden egg here. Um, okay, okay. My, my, I, sometimes these terms get interchanged and they mean different things. So right. my, my error. Okay. No, no problem. Well, it's there's a little bit of alphabet soup going on here because right after we finish hearing from Ms. Manchester, we're going to be hearing from the Department of Public Service about the CEP, the Climate, uh, the Comprehensive Energy Plan, which is on its own six-year cycle and has a relationship to the CAP. Okay. Okay. So it is. <laughs> I can understand how it gets a little confusing. Um, uh, you know, the one thing I wanted to say, Ms. Manchester, is that we know, you know, last year we did a lot of work on weatherization, and we are going to be doing a committee bill. Um, so that means that by January 31st, we'll have formally introduced something that lets us work, um, to continue our work on weatherization. So um, if you are stymied somewhat by a lack of a full pathways report, one of the things we'll know we want to go ahead on is weatherization. And um, if that is helpful to you in terms of something you know you could bear down on, because uh, we're, we're certain we'll be moving forward on that again. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I, I noticed yesterday that the Vermont Climate Council is identifying either two or four top priority items. And certainly weatherization is one of those, electric vehicles is another one. So we, we do have some, some specific policies to look at. The question is, what's the scale year by year and what's the cost year by year? And how is that ramp up going to happen? So we'll be talking about some of that um, as I go through the issue brief today. Okay, great, thank you. So I'd like to share my screen. I prepared some, uh, some slides to help us. Uh, I hope you're seeing my screen, yes? Not quite yet. There we go. Okay, good. Um, right, so I'm, I'm going to be talking 
today about the issue brief and I'll be running through it as it was, it was uh, released back in December. This title is Climate Change and Public Policy Solutions in Vermont. And again, it was co-authored with Brianna Parker. Uh, the question is why is my, there we go. So uh, there will be three parts to did it today's talk. The first part has to do with existing Vermont programs for greenhouse gas reduction. We'll be looking back over the past five years or so. Part two will look more specifically at the requirements that were set by the Global Warming Solutions Act. And again, you, you saw a little bit of this yesterday, but we will review. And part three has to do with uh, some possible forthcoming strategies and associated considerations. So this is a broad look. This is not specifically what's available in the climate action plan that's been recommended by the Vermont Climate Council, but it, it, it's, it's sort of a big picture view of um, various actions that could be taken. So we'll start with part one. And as you know, Vermont already has a lot of programs in place to reduce carbon emissions and to improve adaptation and resilience. And remember that all three of those pieces are part of the Global Warming Solutions Act. So it's not enough, according to the GWSA, to reduce carbon emissions, according to the quantitative targets. We also have to improve adaptation and resilience, according to the law. So I first wanted to note that there are lots of state agencies that are involved in uh, reducing climate ch change effects, agencies of natural resources, administration, transportation, agriculture, food and markets, and commerce and community development, as well as the Department of Public Service. So we have lots of players that have a key role to play here. Now, if anyone is interested in exact programs and exact numbers, you should be looking at the appendix that is part of the issue brief that was released back in December. It's a very large table. I tried <laughs> to show it on a, on a slide and it just, uh, it's too much. So if you are interested in specific numbers or specific programs, JFO worked quite diligently to try to collect lots of programs from lots of places and you will find those all listed in the appendix table. So what comes out of that table, if you look in broad brush strokes across the table, you'll see that during fiscal years 2018 through 2021, we had about $160 million per year devoted to addressing climate change in Vermont. Of that amount, about 100 million per year came from the state budget and about 60 million came through the energy efficiency utility program some of you know uh, Efficiency Vermont is part of, part of that program and a, a very big part of that program. So that's how the dollars shake out during the past four years. And then we come to fiscal year 22, in which we sit now. So the state of Vermont plans to invest more than $228 million of state and federal funds in programs related to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, adapting to climate change, and building resiliency. So about 172 million of that came from state and federal funds. About 50 million came from federal funds in the ARPA Act, the American Rescue Plan Act. The Public Utility Commission plans to invest about 56 million in green initiatives through the Energy Efficiency Utility Program. So there is a bit of a ramp up in FY22. And of course, these state programs range from weatherization to public transportation and electric vehicles to environmental conservation. So there's a, a broad array of programs already happening out there. So lots of programs target the transportation sector in part because transportation is the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions statewide. So already, the state is incentivizing sales of electric, hybrid, and fuel efficient vehicles, encouraging residents to adopt cleaner and more efficient transportation modes, assisting low-income residents with vehicle emissions repairs, and expanding the infrastructure for charging electric vehicles. So there is a lot going on in the transportation sector. As Secretary Moore mentioned yesterday, we really have to ramp that up if we expect to meet our targets by 2030. 
Now, tar- uh, buildings, thermal energy in buildings is the second largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions statewide. And so we have a very uh, active weatherization assistance program to assist Vermonters with low income, with energy efficiency improvements in their homes and also to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And as you know, that's been ongoing for a number of years with significant investments there. Again, as Secretary Moore mentioned yesterday, we think we're doing well in that area, but in fact, we will need to ramp up significantly in order to hit our targets. Any questions on those programs before we move on to the requirements in the GWSA? So the Global Warming Solutions Act passed in 2020 puts those requirements for greenhouse gas emissions into law and says that the state can be sued if we are not making sufficient progress towards those goals. So here's a picture showing what our emissions have been. That's the blue dotted line. Um, Then we have the uh, 2005 and the 1990 baseline levels. And as you'll recall, the GWSA sets those greenhouse gas emission targets in terms of reductions relative to first 2005 and then uh, 1990. So you can see between 2017, where we have the latest reading on greenhouse gas emissions in the state, between 2017 and 2025, there is a continued ramp down but then between 2025 and 2030, it becomes much steeper. So in order to hit the 2030 targets, we have to start taking action now. Um, I have a quick data question. I have noticed in a number of these charts, there are spiky years. Uh, So I'm looking at on this one, like 2014, 15. Um, Do you happen to know if this is just weather related you know, particularly cold winter comes through and there's more uh, emissions related to home heating. So I think I've looked at this before and I'm going to be talking a bit off the cuff because I haven't looked at it lately, but I think there are a number of things going on in 2015. Um, And I can check on this to be sure. But um, one thing is that Vermont Yankee went offline in which year, 2011? maybe. Um, So that, well, okay, I'll have to check the timing on that, but that had an effect. Also, we had a recovery from the economic recession, and it was a very slow recovery through the early 2010s. Um, It was picking up speed by 2015. Um, There were a number of uh, programs that were going into effect after 2015 that brought the average down. So yeah, okay. I think there were lots of things going on, but I can I can check on some of those if you like. Curious. Okay, so that's where we have to go. And also, I should mention that all of these uh, points on the graph here are measured in terms of what's called MMTCO2E. You can see that over on the left hand um, axis. That is million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. So it's all. Uh, measured in terms of carbon, but it includes other pollutants as well. So the million metric tons of CO2E you will see in many places as the measurement of greenhouse gas emissions. And my final point on this slide is that by 2050, you can see we're down at 1.73 million metric tons. That's 80% below the 1990 level. Um, that that will be uh, a challenging target to meet. And also that 2050 target is also uh, uh, described as net zero emissions. So it assumes that we have enough sequestration coming from forests and from soils to offset that 1.73 in terms of the gross emissions. Okay, so we've got pollutants coming into the air, but we've also got forests and soils that are absorbing some of those uh, pollutants or most of those by 2050. Um, Senator McDonald, do you have a question? Okay. Okay. Too many, I'll I'll, I'll be quiet. (laughs) 
I'm happy to answer questions as we go through. I think it, it helps everybody stay tuned in. Um, okay, so here's a table that shows the sources of greenhouse gas emissions in Vermont. Um, both of these, both the table and the, the figure come from the greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast. So you can see here, as I mentioned, transportation and mobile combustion represent 39% of our emissions. Residential and commercial fuel use, that's the thermal residential buildings uh, emissions represent 31%. So put those together and you get 70%, a very large share of emissions. Next comes agriculture at almost 16%. And then we have industry and electric generation, waste and a tiny bit from the fossil fuel industry. So you can see where we have to put our major focus and that will be on transportation and thermal energy. So as I said, those two sectors, 70% greenhouse gas emissions. We know that technologies exist currently in order to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions, but um, they do require some large upfront investments. Now, the, the, uh, the other side is that they probably result in lower long-term operating costs. So if we can get people to adopt these new technologies, then in the longer run, their operating costs will be less. But the hurdle is the, the initial investment. So this is the case for electric vehicles, certainly. Um, there's a price to be paid for electric vehicles. You've got to find charging stations. You've got to get used to the idea of not stopping by a gas station on every corner. Um, heat pumps, cold weather heat pumps work in Vermont. But again, there's an initial upfront investment that is um, not insignificant. Uh, however, you do sa save money in future years because your heating costs are less. So the point here is that publicly funded programs can play an important role in an equitable transition to electrifying both our transportation and our thermal sectors. But we have to be very thoughtful about how that uh, public involvement happens. And we have to have money in order to make it happen. So those are the big challenges for you all as policymakers. I do have a slide here to talk about gross versus net emissions. I know I was confused by this uh, when I first read the Comprehensive Energy Plan and, and the Global Warming Solutions Act. I did talk about this uh, earlier, so I don't wanna to spend too much time on it, but it is true that both 2025 and 2030 GWSA requirements focus only on the gross annual emissions. So how much are we generating that's going into the air? The 2050 requirement is zero net carbon emissions, meaning that we count not only what's going into the air, but also what's being sequestered in forests and soils. The, the issue is that forests are sequestering less and less CO2 equivalent over time because we are losing acreage um, and, and maybe also because we aren't managing the forest as well as we could. So uh, you can see in the lower part of the slide, gross emissions in 2017 were 8.67 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. So the forests were sequestering about 4.63 million, so about a little over half. Net emissions in 2017, 4.24, but um, that sequestration coming from forests is declining over time. And so we, we need to be careful about how we're managing our, our forest resources as well as our agricultural soils. You mean we're, the forests are being cut? Is that what you're saying? We are losing acreage. Uh, forest acreage has been declining. Um, and also we may not be managing the forests as, as best we could. There's a, there's a lot to be, to be discussed in terms of forest sequestration. Of course, if you cut down the forest, um, you're no longer actively sequestering, right? The, the green leaves are no longer absorbing the, the carbon dioxide. Um, if you burn that, that log, you are sending some of that carbon back into the air. So what had been sequestered is now turning into carbon emissions. On the other hand, if, if you turn that log into furniture, you are essentially capturing that carbon and holding onto it as long as the furniture 
is not burned up, right? As long as it's not emitting the carbon. So there's there are many complications uh, along with forest sequestration. I'm no expert, but um, I've I've been interested to learn a little bit more about it. Yeah, and just a note for all of us. So as part of the Act 250 bill, will we? Do, we'll be doing it includes um, addressing forestry and because I think this committee has been alarmed by the trend I think depending on whose numbers you're looking at we're we're losing something like 11 to 15,000 acres a year which honestly I, I don't quite understand how it's the, how we're doing that because uh, <clears throat> Senator Westman so I would, um, and Senator Campion has brought this issue up a, a number of times on the committee. I would like to spend some time more with that. I'd like to know how much of that is um, people building um, houses in development and then cutting big long driveways into, into chunks of land. And um, so I, I, I can't really tell how much of this is um, bad um, forestry management practices versus people um, developing our countryside. Right. So, um, yeah, as uh, Senator Campion, as you said, he's been helping us keep our eye on this. And I think we're all disappointed to see how the trend has gotten um, continued and maybe gotten worse. So um, while it's our turn, we would, I think we'd all like to turn that around. So, okay. So thank you. Just related to that, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes. I, I did uh, take a look last evening at uh, President Biden's, it's the um, America Beautiful, uh, America the Beautiful Act, which again is setting aside, or hoping to set aside 30% of American land um, and I, I don't know if there are ways that this committee can collaborate, uh, how the state of Vermont is collaborating, but it might just be interesting. It might be a good way to review this conversation by bringing A&R back in at some point to see how they're, they're working with our federal partners on this. Right, great. Thank you for that reminder. I think it's a 30 by 30, 30%. 30%. Um, and obviously, well, given that uh, forest land covers 75% of Vermont now, although most 80% of that is privately held. I don't, um, you know, the good news is we have a lot of green space already, but the, the bad news is that we are, uh, we're, it's trending the wrong way. So thanks, there's, I think this is probably a, it's a slow, quiet, but really important thing for us to make some uh, progress on this session. Well, just, um Mr. Chair, the marketplace encourages people to cut forests down and sell the lumber. Um, that's what, that's why the forests are being reduced. Um, so unless you've got a plan to encourage people not to cut it down and sell it for chips or lumber or whatever and to use it for other purposes, then it's gonna continue to happen, so. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Senator West. Um, I, I think we took some testimony and there's quite a lot of evidence that um, there is a breakup of land ownership into smaller and smaller pieces. And, um, and I, I'm worried that that plays a huge piece in this. And we keep hearing about that, but we don't seem to be able to get our arms around quantifying that. Okay. Uh, Senator Westman is correct. There is money to be made in developing forest land for housing. There's money to be made in cutting forest land down and selling the product. And those are profitable activities in a society that um, believes in free markets. And we will continue to see throughout Vermont and the rest of the world forests being cut down because cutting them down is profitable and makes money for the people that own those properties. So unless we deal with it 
and make it no longer profitable, it's going to continue to happen. I would just add that there is a new uh, carbon offset market that some folks, some landowners in Vermont are participating in. And of course, that carbon offset market pays owners to maintain their forests so that they are sequestering carbon. The question is, uh, does Vermont want to be selling its sequestration to California or to airlines? Or do we want to hold on to that sequestration for Vermont's offsets? So there's a lot to be analyzed in, in that whole area. And um, it's an area of interest. And uh, there are folks at, at a &R who are working on it. So I'm sure the committee can hear further testimony on that. Is that a voluntary market? Is it, yes, it's voluntary. Uh -huh. Well, well. So those people who choose not to join the forest, the voluntary market for carbon offsets, will continue to profit by cutting forests down as they do is going on throughout the world. So we we had a little testimony on the the carbon markets as uh, forest. Uh, income for forest owners for keeping forest mm -hmm. forests and and receiving payments for the, the sequestration activities. But uh, Ms. Manchester brought up a point I hadn't really thought about. When we uh, monetize that value and sell it, then we can no longer book it as part of our own portfolio. So um, the more, work, more work to do. Object to deal with portfolios or to not cut down forests. Okay. It's so, interesting. So my husband and I have had exactly that conversation. And uh, <laughs> I don't think there's a right answer, but it's it's a really interesting issue. But well, I mean, a fundamental, because that's where we, how we sequester carbon on this planet, is by not cutting down forests. Okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the only way maybe, and just to throw this into that, the conversation, Mr. Chair, is, is if the state were to make purchases, create a fund that does set land aside in that old traditional way that, you know, uh, purchase land from landowners, set it aside, make larger tracts of forest and, and preserve them. Right. Well, yeah, and I think, I mean, this is a topic that merits a lot more discussion there there's also what do you have to do on that forest land in order to earn your sequestration credits you know can you still sustainably manage and harvest or do you have to leave it alone and entirely alone um, use value is being reconsidered in the house i believe to look at um, allowing people to have no harvesting requirements on a, a parcel or forested parcel and remain in good standing in UVA. So there's active work going on um, and we'll come back to it. I'm just mindful of the time. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, lose our chance to hear the balance of your report, Ms. Manchester. Sure. So we have more interesting things to talk about as well. Uh, we're moving on now to part three, which talks about some forthcoming strategies and associated considerations. So it's certainly true that we will not be able to adopt three or four policies and hope to meet our targets. I think the targets are going to require a very broad swath of policies to be implemented in order to achieve those targets. So one important aspect for policymakers is to think about both equity being fair to all parts of society, uh, folks with low income, folks in rural areas, uh, people employed in specific industries and so forth, but also the efficiency. So we wanna achieve the largest reduction in emissions per dollar invested. So both of these considerations are paramount going forward. So I wanna talk a, a little bit, oh, sorry. I need to get back to my, uh, here we go. Now, why is this not advancing? There we go. So uh, as I mentioned, we want to avoid any disproportionate hardship on certain Vermonters. Um, historically, it's been true that people with higher incomes 
have been early adopters of big technological and social transformations. And I'm thinking here about electricity in the early days, broadband, certainly public education way back in the 1700s. Um, so those early adopters are already doing their thing in Vermont, buying electric vehicles and, and heat pumps and so forth. But people with lower incomes generally have been less able to benefit because of those upfront costs we mentioned earlier, because of price adjustments, lifestyle changes, other unforeseen consequences. So now we are looking at electrification of vehicles and heating, and we especially need to pay attention to Vermonters with low and middle incomes, those living in rural areas and others who might be adversely affected. So this is going to be a challenge going forward, certainly. I wanted to talk about some of the big picture ways to address climate change and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I'm gonna start with uh, uh, an approach known as carbon pricing, also known as carbon taxes, carbon fees, all of that sort of thing. So here, the idea would be that, that a, an extra tax or an extra fee gets tacked on to the cost of using energy. Um, the, the good part about a, a carbon fee or a carbon tax is that it does generate revenues, which can then be invested to reduce emissions or distributed to ease that disproportionate effect, especially for citizens with low and middle incomes. So um, you'll recall that a couple of years ago in 2019, the legislature asked for a report from Resources for the Future in which they looked at a carbon tax and we called it decarbonization uh, back in the day. Um, the bottom line there was that a carbon tax is not gonna do a lot on its own for Vermont because we've already done a lot in terms of electricity generation and so forth. However, a carbon tax or fee would generate a lot of revenue that could be then invested in public policy initiatives. For example, that could help pay for uh, the incentives that we need to help low and middle income people buy heat pumps and electric vehicles and set up charging stations throughout the state and so forth and so on. So it is one way to generate revenue um, and it is directly related to the carbon emissions that come from, from uh, energy consumption. I would just note parenthetically that there was just a a big survey of uh, economists in, in the US, 1400 economists were asked for their opinions about various statements and a large majority of economists would favor a market-based solution for addressing climate change. So that means either carbon pricing or the next item I'll talk about, which is a cap and trade system. So let's think about a cap and trade system now that's sort of going at the quantity of carbon emissions rather than the price of carbon emissions, okay? See, so in carbon pricing, you set the price and you see what happens to emissions and then you adjust the price as needed. In a cap and trade system, you set the quantity and the market determines the price that industry has to pay in order to pollute more than they've been allowed, okay? And generally speaking, once you've set a cap, you can then adjust that cap over time. Quite often you adjust it downward to try to reduce carbon emissions over time. But again, there will be a price on carbon emissions that is determined by the market. So as you know, Vermont already participates in a cap and trade system for electricity through the, the REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And that has been working for a number of years and has helped in uh, reducing carbon emissions from the electricity sector. Certainly a similar program could be set up for heating and transportation sectors to limit emissions and to incentivize switching to lower emission fuel sources. And again, that approach works best when it's coupled with public policies, public investment to help address the equity concerns. Because again, you, you don't wanna leave the uh, low and middle income folks out of the transition. So I who opposes that solution? Where's the opposition come from? How come it hasn't taken place? Right, so I, I believe that yesterday, Jared Duvall uh, addressed 
the question, why did the uh, Vermont Climate Council not consider carbon taxes? And his answer was that carbon taxes have been seen in other places to not be as effective as one had hoped. And also that they do place this extra burden on low and middle income folks, especially low uh, income folks and um, people living in rural areas who have to depend on transportation in order to get to work and so forth. Um, so the comeback from economists would be that uh, prices adjust in order to, to meet the targets and that you use the revenue in order to offset those equity effects. And this, this is one way to directly generate the revenues that would be needed to offset the, the equity impacts. So uh, this is a conversation that will go on, uh, I'm sure, as, as the climate action plan is discussed in the legislature. But I, I, I do think that it's worth considering the various approaches before latching onto any specific ones. Certainly the TCI, there was quite a lot of discussion yesterday about the Transportation Climate Initiative. That is a type of cap and trade system. So if that had gone forward, that would have applied something like Reggie to the transportation uh, sector. And presumably there could be a cap and trade system that also applies to the heating sector. Um, that's part of the WCI, the uh, Western Climate Initiative. So um, let's see, I did, before we move off the slide, I did also wanna mention that uh, back in 2019, following the Resources for the Future report, the legislature also commissioned a report from RAP, the Regulatory Assistance Project. Uh, that report was very helpful in identifying ways that public investment could be made in terms of weatherization and electric vehicles and so forth to, to um, help people with low incomes get into uh, heat pumps and electric vehicles and so forth. Um, Ms. Manchester, could you do us the favor of sending that report, the RAP report on, which we've looked at and Rich Coward's been in, for instance, but um, we're on to a new year. If you could send it to Jude and she'll send it out to everyone in the committee and put it up on our webpage, that would be great. Um, a quick question. So when I think about carbon pricing versus cap and trade, let me check in with you and see if I have it right. And the carbon pricing scheme, it generates an explicit revenue that then can be managed to address for the disproportionate impact on low-income um, uh, energy users, right? But in the cap and trade system, it's the providers of the products that have to have the allowances. So as they um, comply with the law and buy allowances, um, that cost is going to be, I suppose you might say, baked into the product. It doesn't necessarily generate a revenue stream that comes to the state. Is that right or wrong? I'm just trying to think of, do we, ha do we have less of an ability in a cap and trade system to generate revenues and then use them in ways that would help um, address the disproportionate impact on uh, energy burdened households? Yes, so that's a good point. And whether the state gets revenue depends very much on how the cap and trade system is set up. For example, the TCI program would have generated hundreds of millions of dollars for the state of Vermont because the, the allowances were being bought and sold through the state and the state uh, received many of those revenues. So it really depends on how the, the system is set up. Uh -huh. But you're right to ask that question. Okay, thank you. Okay, and finally, we, we get to the third general approach, which is direct public investment. And that can take many different forms, technology subsidies, grants for innovation and research, procurement standards, for example, requiring that the state fleet only purchase EVs going forward. That would be an example of a procurement standard and clean energy products. So this would be part of uh, RES, for example, setting, setting regulatory standards for um, where energy is coming from. So uh, one, one aspect is that public investment probably needs to pay attention to efficiency. In other words, where are we getting the biggest bang for our buck? And so when you're weatherizing a home, you wanna focus on insulation because insulation gives you more greenhouse gas savings 
per dollar invested than buying new windows, for example. So um, to increase equities, programs could include tiered subsidies based on income or direct support for rural households. So maybe you say, okay, we pay 100% of weatherization expenses for households under a certain income level. We pay 80%, 60%, and so forth. So that you're, you're targeting the lowest households first with your public dollars and then uh, subsidizing, but not fully paying for those investments with maybe middle, middle income households. So secondly, grants for innovation and research could spur new technologies that may have long-term benefits by carrying more risks. That's certainly a, a, a reasonable area for public investment. And uh, setting efficiency standards for, for state purchases is a way to, to lead by example at the same time that you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I would also say that having electric vehicles in the state fleet gives more people the opportunity to try driving one and see how they work. And so that may be a way to, to help incentivize people. Okay, now what about moving forward on reducing carbon emissions? So as you know, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was signed into law in November, 2021. And that provides a substantial amount of money in the transportation area in particular to help Vermont make investments towards electrifying the transportation sector. Uh, the Build Back Better uh, bill is maybe on resuscitation at this point, but there's some chance that, that there will be further investment funds coming from Washington to help Vermont in um, public investments in electric vehicles, charging stations, heat pumps, hot water heat pumps, and cleaner fuel. So there may be more federal funds coming, and certainly ARPA has provided a, a large number of dollars to Vermont in order to invest in climate uh, approaches. Mr. Chair, the, um, please. All, all of that is, all, all that was just said was true, but the Infrastructure Investment Act is a step backwards in carbon. It, it uses more carbon than it saves. It's every, the analysis of that law is it's a, uh, that it, it does not um, sequester carbon, it uses more than, than would have been used if the law hadn't passed. Um, the, that's, that's just what that law does. And um, it, sure, it sends us money, but we're sliding in the wrong direction when we take that money. It's not enough to, to make, to move us in further into carbon sequestration. Yes, and there's certainly a debate about whether we should be expanding our transportation networks, building more highways and so forth, because that invites more automobile traffic and so forth. Um, these are all very good issues to be discussed, absolutely. Well, we're, either we're, you know, so, so are we discussing um, building more highways or are we discussing how do we reduce carbon use? Um, the Global Warming Solutions Act is not about building more highways. It's about reducing carbon use. Um, so we're eager to hear about things that we can do that reduce the uh, putting carbon into the atmosphere as opposed to um, getting money to uh, put more carbon into the atmosphere. I, I understand. Um, I think it's important to remember that the Global Warming Solutions Act also requires uh, adaptation and resilience so that we cannot just focus on reducing carbon, but we also have to think about where we build new housing so that it's not subject to extreme flooding and so forth. Um, there, just, how do we just, build charging infrastructure so that we can support the electric vehicles we need? All, all of that. So, okay. So the Climate Action Plan released by the Vermont Climate Council December 1st, 2021, illustrates steps that Vermont needs to take to reach the GWSA requirements in 2025, 2030, and 2050. Um, here I made a point not to be overlooked. The Climate Council recognizes the critical importance of maintaining a focus on social justice. And again, this has to do with Vermonters with low incomes, uh, Vermonters who live in rural areas and so forth. And we really do need participation by all households at all income levels. 
especially those with low and middle incomes, if we are going to ramp up to such an extent to meet those targets by 2025, 2030, and then eventually 2050. So finally, I've included a list of resources for the committee. Uh, the issue brief, uh, look at that. I even have the, the wrap uh, issue brief on that slide. So I think now the committee has that uh, reference. Right. Um, I've given you the, the link to the, the JFO website where that report is still available. Um, I've also given you the links to the issue brief, the climate action plan itself, and the greenhouse gas emissions inventory in case those are helpful. So thank you very much for the chance to talk with you today. I'm happy to answer further questions. I know we're three minutes over time. Well, um, thanks for bringing just the right amount of information to help us uh, keep on keep on making progress on this. Um, I, I'll just flag something for us to come back to because um, I think it's a much longer conversation. I think on your prior slide, uh, the phrase used was uh, social justice. And I'm feeling like um, there's a certain amount of uh, conflation going on when we, you know, I, I hear terms like environmental justice, social justice, um, income inequality, and uh, we're trying to address all of them, but sometimes the, I'm, I'm not saying you're doing this, but different parties are using the terms in, uh, in ways that are sometimes confusing. Like to what degree are we actually um, focusing on emissions versus actually just social policy that we say this particular economy has too many people earning too few, too little money, and therefore we're going to try to help them their, uh, raise their standard of living by explicit work. It just sort of happens to come in the form of energy related work, but it's uh, a income inequality or social justice mission in the form of energy policy. Sometimes it's the other way around and it's energy policy leading, and then there's social justice considerations to be considered on, on the way there. And um, so it's something I'm noticing more and more in our conversations in the last year. And um, I'm still trying to figure it out and keep it clear. And I, I know economists are good at defining terms. So we'll, we'll want to ask you to help our, keep our thinking clear on this as we keep working. Right. Certainly, yeah. and I, kn I know that the Vermont Climate Council has spent a lot of time thinking about social equity, social justice, uh, the BIPOC community, low-income folks, um, yes, and they're trying to get feedback from, from focus groups and so forth in order to make sure that everybody is included in, in the plan going forward. Right, and this committee will be Looking into that issue, I think through the um, in the form of S one forty eight, which was submitted at the end of last session, uh, environmental justice bill, and um, so we'll be taking a, a much deeper dive in the weeks ahead. With that, um, I want to thank you very much for coming in and helping us out today. And we look forward to continuing to work with you and your colleagues uh, in the coming months, because there is, is certainly an, an area of uh, lots going on, it's a, a, a daunting and exciting both. Um, in terms of committee, we have our next witness at 10.30. So we'll have a nine minute break and, um, and then we'll jump back in for the balance of the morning on the comprehensive energy plan. So thanks very much.